Thank you, Dr. Harold. Uh, it's my pleasure to present uh, 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 the results of the Teresa study uh, that were again just uh, highlighted in a late-breaking clinical trial session. Um, the background for the study is that uh, angina, as most of you know, is a very common uh, healthcare issue. It affects about 8 million patients in the United States. Uh, it has very significant impact on health status and quality of life and a uh, major driver of hospitalizations and healthcare costs. And patients with diabetes really represent a, um, a particularly high risk and therapeutically challenging group uh, because they have a higher burden of coronary disease and a higher burden of angina. Uh, Ranolizin has previously been shown to be effective as an antianginal agent uh, and actually may have additional property of lowering fasting glucose and hemoglobin A1C. Um, uh, and as, as a result of that, may be uh, uniquely positioned uh, in patients with diabetes, but it's never been prospectively studied uh, in uh, patients with diabetes for its antianginal efficacy. And so the primary objective of Teresa uh, was really to um, uh, examine whether uh, renolazine is an effective antianginal agent in patients with type 2 diabetes can come in coronary disease uh, in stable chronic angina. So it was a randomized placebo-controlled trial, phase 4 trial. Um, it, uh, at the end, we had about 927 patients in the final analysis, uh, 462 in the renolazine arm and 465 in the placebo arm. Uh, patients initially entered the placebo run-in period for about four weeks. Uh, and the purpose of that uh, run-in period uh, was to uh, first establish the baseline angina frequency and then also to ensure that there is appropriate compliance uh, with both the uh, assigned study medication as well as with the electronic diary. Importantly, uh, the symptoms were actually reported using a very novel electronic diary instrument with very high compliance rates. Then after the run-in, uh, patients were entered in a treatment phase for about eight weeks when they were randomly assigned in a double-blind fashion. Uh, to either renolazine at 1,000 milligrams twice a day or to placebo. Um, it was an international study. Uh, patients were recruited from 105 sites in 14 countries. Um, after the data were analyzed, as expected, uh, the characteristics at baseline were well matched between renolazine and placebo group, uh, as it was a randomized clinical trial. Uh, the rates of coronary disease uh, risk factors, such as hypertension, dyslipidemia, were very high, again, as expected. Um, Importantly, patients, um, uh, you know, significant majority of patients were well treated with concomitant medical therapy, such as statins, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, and antiplatelet agents. And again, as I mentioned before, the compliance with the electronic diary was very high in both groups at about 98%. The primary endpoint of Teresa was the um, average weekly angina frequency uh, between the weeks two and eight of treatment. Uh, for this primary endpoint, at baseline, angina frequency was similar between Renaud's and placebo. As expected, these were highly symptomatic patients uh, experiencing between six and a half to seven episodes of angina weekly. Um, between the weeks two and eight of treatment, there was a significantly lower angina frequency in Renaud's group versus the placebo group uh, with uh, 3.8 episodes in the Renaud's 4.3 episodes per week in the placebo, and a p-value of 0.008. Uh, in terms of the key secondary endpoint, which was weekly sublingual nitroglycerin use. Again, at baseline, the results were similar as expected. Um, when we analyzed the data between weeks two and eight of treatment, we saw a significant reduction in weekly sublingual nitroglycerin use in the Renaud's as compared with the placebo groups, uh, 1.7 versus 2.1 doses per week with a p-value of 0 0.003. Um, we did a number of subgroup analysis. Um, the first uh, was the geographic stratification into countries uh, other than Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus versus Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. Uh, there was a significant interaction, a geographic interaction with a P4 interaction of 0 0.016, showing that patients recruited in other countries had very significant reduction in angina frequency, 3.1 versus 4.1 episodes per week uh, for anosin versus placebo and a p-value of 0 0.002. However, in patients recruited in Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, there was no significant difference in the antianginal effect of renolazine in terms of angina frequency, 4.1 versus 4.3 episodes per week for renolazine versus placebo, and a non-significant p-value. A number of other subgroup analyses were performed that showed uniform therapeutic benefit of renolazine versus placebo. One other uh, post hoc exploratory analysis that is of interest is uh, looking at baseline hemoglobin A1C. So when we examine therapeutic effectiveness of renolazine versus placebo and angina frequency, 
in patients with higher versus lower hemoglobin A1C, regardless of which A1C cut point we use, the interaction is statistically significant, showing that patients that have higher baseline hemoglobin A1C have greater therapeutic benefit from ranolazine as compared with placebos in patients with lower hemoglobin A1C. So to summarize, uh, what Teresa's study showed was that ranolazine is, in fact, effective antianginal treatment uh, in patients with type 2 diabetes and concomitant coronary disease and chronic stable angina and reduces angina frequency and subluminal nitroglycerin use as compared with placebo. The effect of ranolazine was greater in patients that were recruited outside of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus and in those with higher hemoglobin A1C. And of course, future studies are needed to actually determine whether ranolazine has this unique dual benefit of both antianginal effect and glucose lowering in these patients. Well, thank you. I'll have you remain at the podium, uh, Dr. Quinones. Well, this is, I think, in, do, doing to, in today's environment, doing studies where symptoms are endpoints are very, very hard. And I think this is one of the very best studies I have ever seen. Um, I think the investigators went through a lot of excellent effort, and, uh, including uh, state-of-the-art technology to be able to document symptoms as well as possible. So I think this is, this is terrific. Problem is, we still have the issue of what the symptom means in terms of the whole pathophysiology of disease. And so the first, the first thing that we learned from this study is if you all see the placebo curves, everybody got better. So it shows you the effect of placebo, and that's why anecdotal benefits that people observe with drugs uh, are always difficult to pinpoint as to their certainty. Um, but clearly, the drug group, the therapy group, had further benefits. The big question here is, are patients experiencing symptom relief or reduction in ischemia? So one of the big interesting questions here is, could we do an outcome trial over time to see whether those same patients who are reducing, those people that have the higher hemoglobin A1C, who are having the benefit of reduction of angina, do they also have over three years perhaps better outcomes? And obviously those are questions being raised. For, for further use because symptoms and ischemia don't always go together and diabetics are the worst because most di diabetics have a very high frequency of silent ischemia. In fact, I'm I suspect this was a very hard trial to do because to get diabetics that have that much frequent angina to track is not easy because diabetics as a group have silent ischemia. This is their, it's topping the list of problems that they have. We, we tell diabetics, we cannot trust you, you're not trustworthy, because we cannot trust your symptoms, because they can have severe ischemia and, and, and just be short of breath. So, um, so again, it be, it, this is the question that is raised. Are we treating symptoms? Are we reducing ischemia? Which then would have real benefit long term away. And then this issue with hemorrhoid in A1C is just fascinating, because the group that had very good control of diabetes had almost no effect. I mean, the benefit was almost none at all which raises a question because in other trials with the drug in non-diabetics, it has been beneficial. So now I'm really confused. I mean, <laughs> maybe you're as confused as I am, but I, would, I wish to, to hear from you, how do you put that together? Right. Trials on non-diabetics have shown efficiency, yet here we have the group with the best control of diabetes having minuscule, if anything, of a benefit. How, how do we put that together? Right, so uh, I'll address, I think you raised three very important questions, so I'll kind of address them, Dr. Quinones, one by one. Uh, the first, I guess, is, uh, is the issue of looking at patient symptoms as an endpoint in the trial, and as you mentioned, it's very challenging uh, because of a profound placebo effect, uh, which is uniformly observed in antianginal trials. Uh, and so to show a benefit on top of that very profound placebo effect is always a huge challenge. We specifically wanted to uh, go after patient symptoms, patient reported symptoms, and use the electronic technology that you mentioned to try to capture it as well as we can, because from our standpoint, when it comes to angina, uh, yes, obviously, ischemic burden is important. Of course, you know, objective evidence is important, but what at the end matters to patients uh, is how, how much they have in terms of symptoms. What matters to cardiologists who prescribe antianginal medications at the end is whether the patient's symptomatic or not. At the end of the day, you know, I'm not going to prescribe an antianginal agent to a patient because uh, they have, you know, 2% uh, more ischemia in a nuclear study or uh, because they walk for 10 meters more in the treadmill, but it's because they're complaining of more angina. So from a clinical standpoint, uh, we felt that it was the most patient-centered, clinically meaningful outcome. Now, 
As far as uh, looking at other outcomes, it's very important. As you know, uh, anginal symptoms is actually what drives, um, uh, frequently drives rehospitalizations. Uh, that's what frequently drives uh, repeat procedures and healthcare costs. And so actually looking at those outcomes uh, is very important. And in fact, there is a study that's currently on the way to look at those outcomes, such as re repeat hospitalizations uh, in, in these patients with, uh, uh, with um, uh, inadequate revascularization after PCI. There is actually a study going on right now, uh, an outcome study. So that's question number one. Uh, the question number two uh, had to do, uh, uh, so, so I'm just trying to organize myself here. There were three different questions. That was one. It was the symptoms versus the burden of ischemia. And there was uh, the A1C interactions. There was one other one. But no, it's, it's together. It's a paradox. The, the fact that the most benefit was in those people with the poor control. Right. But the opposite, that people who were very well controlled almost had no benefit, yeah. and yet all the trials in non-diabetics have shown significant benefit. And there's right. kind of like a funny contradiction did, there. Did you look at uh, compliance with established anti-anginal regimens? Yes. Uh, and was it the same regardless of the hemoglobin yeah. A1C? Yeah. So actually, uh, the compliance with the baseline anti-anginal therapy, remember that these patients were on either one or two anti-anginal uh, treatments other than the treatment assignment and the trial at baseline, which by protocol was mandated to continue uh, at the same, uh, for the same drugs, the same doses. There were very, very few patients, less than 5% of patients that had any change in baseline therapy, regardless of any subgroups. On the A1C issue, um, I, as I kind of pointed out earlier, there is actually a possible physiologic explanation for, uh, even though it needs to be explored further, obviously, but there is some early preclinical evidence that if you take myocardiocytes uh, and expose them to high glucose concentration, or if you take cardiomyocytes from diabetic animals, hearts of diabetic animals, they actually have greater late INA current. Uh, and so because the renosin, of course, targets late INA, it's possible that that's the reason why we see more of a renosin effect in patients with high hemoglobin A1C. There are some other possible explanations as well that we're exploring. I would, however, point out in terms of the effect, remember that uh, this is a test for statistical, the statistical test, just to be very careful here, uh, it's for the interaction. Right. Uh, so the interaction test is significant. We are not powered to actually look at the Reynolds and effect in different hemoglobin right. A1C yeah. groups, so we cannot make a statement. That's a very good point. Yeah, yeah, you cannot make a statement that it's more effective, yeah. but then non-effective in right. those with lower A1C. Yeah. As you said, in very patients who didn't have diabetes, mm -hmm. we already know that it's effective as an anti angel So it's really the magnitude of effect, really. That's all we can say from the statistical test okay. rather than presence versus absence. Any questions uh, from the audience? 